Yeah. All right. Hey, I'm gonna pray for us, um, and then we're gonna we're gonna kind of jump into this series we've called Impossible uh, in the Book of John. So in the Bible, you find the Book of John, and what you see is that um, it was 100% a recording of who um, of how he saw Jesus. John recorded all that he saw Jesus do, and and all that. Um, all the, the, the miracles and everything. And in the book of John, in the first half of the book of John, he says, hey, here are several things that Jesus did that were just impossible. That just like blew my mind. Here is what they did. And so over the past few weeks, we've just kind of been like looking at those things of like, man, what are the impossible things that Jesus really did? And so we're gonna continue to dive into that tonight. But I'm gonna pray for us real quick and then we'll do that. God, I love you. I thank you for this time. I thank you for uh, my friends being here. Just this opportunity for us to open your word, um, to read your word, to be changed by your word. Lord, would you help us um, to truly digest it? God, will we truly take it in, um, consider it, consider who you are, will we consider the impossible things you do and know that they are impossible things or the things we seem as possible today that you can still do? And so God, will we just be mindful of that? God, would you speak through me? Um, would you give my friends um, just um, minds to understand and ears to hear and, and a heart to be changed by you, God? Um, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing and, and what you will do. <clears throat> would you bless tonight? We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> hey, so um, as kids, did any of y'all ever um, like go to your grandparents' house with your cousins and like spend like a week in the summer there? Like anybody ever do that? You go like go and have like a cousin time at your grandparents' house? Anybody? Cool, all right, one of you. Sweet, then you're gonna know what I'm talking about. So as a kid, we'd do this all the time. Um, in the summertime, we would go to my grandparents' house, my cousins would show up, we'd stay for like a week, and we would uh, literally, it sounds kind of weird, but we would like take our shirts off and go outside, and then like when my parents came a week later, we'd put our shirts back on and go back inside. Like that's just what we did for the entire week um, we played cowboys and Indians. We were the Indians. Our, the girls' cousins were the cowboys, and we would scalp them, literally pull their hair, right? So it was brutal. It was brutal in my neck of the woods, man. Um, we didn't play no games. We were, we were real. So we would also, um, we would also like, at night, try to get up the courage to spend the night in the fort. So my, my grandparents were on like three and a half or four acres. They still are in a town of about 500 people. It's Tuscola, Texas. Probably never been there, never heard of it. Super small town, um, really peaceful town, but, but also that means there wasn't a lot of city lights, there wasn't a lot of things, so it would get really dark at night. And so we would try to get up the courage. We'd, we'd get our bed, like our, our blankets and our pillows, and we'd go out to this fort that was like kind of in the middle of their three or four acres, and we'd, we'd go and try to sleep in, um, in the fort. But every time, right, we'd lay out there, we'd start talking about the craziest stuff, right? We're like little kids, but like what we would talk about often is like cannibals. And we're like, you know those, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Like, you know those people that like eat people? We're like, oh man, you think there's cannibals around here? Right, and then we'd just like get in our minds. We would be so, so scared. The other thing we'd talk about was, was aliens. We're like, man, do you think aliens are like come? Like, would they like abduct us? And so we like had like these crazy thoughts. And then one night we're literally sitting in there, kind of one night in particular, we're sitting there, kind of like chilling. And and my my grandparents had these big fig bush trees, like giant things. You couldn't see through them. They weren't too far from the fort. It was kind of dark, so you couldn't really like see what was going on anyway. And behind this fig tree, we see like a light start flickering, like like a bright light. And then we start hearing like, and we're like, dude, that's a UFO. Like 100%, what we just, they heard us and they're coming, like that's a UFO. We're kind of looking at it. I go back to turn around to tell my cousins like, dude, what do y'all think that is? And they're 100% gone. They didn't get abducted. They were in the house. They left me in the fort 100% by myself with an alien attack happening. Like, I'm, I'm not making this up. Like, it was legit happening. I was terrified. And it was in that moment, it was in that moment that I realized how much my cousins really loved me. As they were like, forget this dude. We just gotta make it out before him. 
We don't got to outrun the aliens. We just got to outrun Caleb. And they left me in the fort. See, here's the point. Listen, right here. I was right here. It's in the scary moments. It's in the scary moments that you really figure out who, who cares about you. It's in the tough moments that you really figure out who your friends really are. It's, it's in the tough moments that you figure out who you can trust. Like ultimately, it's in your toughest moments. It's in the moments where you make a bad decision uh, with your friends and your friends either decide whether to help take the blame for what happened or they totally throw you under the bus to save themselves. It's in the tough moments of your life that you figure out who around you is truly a friend and who around you is just using you to continue to do what they want to do. It's in those tough moments. And and here's where I want to go tonight is that I I believe the same is with Jesus. That it is in uh, the tough moments and in the hard moments in your life that I think Jesus' intention for you is that in those tough moments that you would look back, that you would see Jesus and that you would realize that he is very much faithful, that he very much does not run from you, but he stands there, he holds his ground, he's with you, he protects you, he provides for you. I think that's, that's why sometimes we go through these tough situations that Jesus would reveal and show himself to be faithful and to be true and to be honest and to be good in your life. And it's in those hard moments. But it takes a tough moment and it takes a hard moment for you to see the character of someone else. And it takes a hard moment and a tough moment for you to see your own character. And it takes a hard moment and a tough moment for you to see the character of Jesus. And so sometimes I think we're led into the tough moments actually as a blessing and as an act of grace that we would see and know the character of our Father who is in heaven. And it's in those tough moments I don't know how you think about the tough moments in your life, but I want you to rethink about them. That God often uses those. And you even see that where we're gonna pick up tonight in John chapter six. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to bring your Bibles. You can open it up to John chapter six. And and, and what you know is that if you weren't here last week, I'm gonna catch you up, is that last week Eve talked about how Jesus fed 5,000 people with one poor kid's uh, like five rolls and a couple fish. And he fed all these people. Well, if you continue in the story, what you see is these 5,000 people, they eat and they're full and like, that was amazing. And then they turn and look at Jesus and they say, man, we want this guy to be king. We want, we want to elect him as our king. If he can feed us from nothing, then he could do anything. We want him to be king. We will be the strongest country, not king of eternity, not king of forever, but king of right now. We'll be the strongest country. We'll be the strongest people. We will rule this world because of this man, he's gonna be our king. But Jesus, you need to understand, has no desire to be your king of right now or to be the king of this country. He says, no, I'm gonna be the king of the world. He says, I am the king of the world. Then in fact, I'm the king of eternity and I'm the king of, of your life. Like that's the role that I desire to have in your life because that is who I am. That I am the king. He says, man, I want you to look at me in that way. I don't care, about, like, like I care, I, I'm not here to like make right now like this glorious moment. We're not living for right now. We're living for eternity. And he says, man, I'm the king of eternity. And so what these people wanted to do in Jesus' plan for this world did not match up. And so if you look in Matthew 14, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you don't know, they're all accounts where these four people from their different perspectives said, man, I saw Jesus live on this earth. I saw what Jesus did and they all recorded it. So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can see they're separate recordings, yet they all line up because it's just from their different perspectives on who Jesus is. And in Matthew 14, you see, he says, man, that Jesus saw this and knew what the crowd was doing and so he sent the disciples into the boat, and then he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And that's where we pick up in John chapter six, verse 16. We said, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into the boat and they started across the sea to Capernaum. It says, darkness had already set in, but Jesus had not yet 
uh, come to them. And it says, and a high wind rose and the sea began to churn. And so these men are, are rowing across the sea and in the middle of the sea, which is a very dangerous thing to happen, this, this storm begins to arise. Now you need to understand, they don't got radios, they're not calling in for help, they don't have flashlights or flares, they don't have any way to, to signal distress. Like if you're caught in the middle of this sea when a, when a storm comes and the storm is too big for your boat, you just die. Like, there, there's nothing you can do except row as hard as you can until your boat capsizes and you drown. And so these men are in, like, a pretty tough situation. Like, they're in a hard moment. It says that, that um, after they had rowed for about three or four miles, and so commentators, theologians conclude that they had likely been rowing for about nine hours. So if it's dark, and let's say it's getting dark at like seven o'clock, they've rowed for nine hours. They're in, in the early morning hours now, just rowing and rowing and probably terrified because they know, man, if this boat turns the wrong direction, it's a wave the wrong direction, it capsizes and they die. This is a scary moment. This is a fearful moment. It says, in the middle of all of this, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. He was coming near to the boat and they were afraid. If you go back to Matthew 14, it says that they even thought it was a ghost. So you gotta know, this is in the middle of the sea, there's no street lights, there's, there, if there's a full moon, you're lucky. If there's not, it's 100% dark. Pitch black, dark, maybe they have a lantern, and so they're rowing, the storm is coming, they look out into the sea, and they see a figure walking along the sea. Well now, the only logical thing for them to conclude is that must be a ghost, and they are terrified about this ghost. Even though, even though they had seen Jesus walk on water. I mean, even though they'd seen Jesus feed 5,000 people, even though they'd seen Jesus heal a lame man, even though they'd seen Jesus turn 120 gallons of water into great and perfect wine, even though they'd seen Jesus do a lot of these big things, in the moment, their fear blinded them. It was like being in a fort at night and thinking a UFO was landing, but what it turns out to be is your grandmother with a flashlight and a water hose. That's a real story. <laughs> She's like, what? Yeah, it was my grandma. She was out in the woods, like, whatever. She's wild. <clears throat> but yet, but yet, your fear blinds you. And so in the middle of the storm that, by the way, Jesus sent them into, in the middle of the storm that Jesus said, go into the water and knew the storm was coming, in the middle of what God had already planned, they didn't remember any of that. They didn't remember the greatness of Jesus. All they saw was their life flashing before their eye. Their character was kind of revealed in this moment and they were terrified. They weren't looking for Jesus. They weren't looking for Jesus because for them, it was not logical for a man to walk on water. But what they forgot is Jesus was not merely a man. He was God and is God. And so they failed to see Jesus. It reminded me of a storm um, that, that I once like kind of weathered. Uh, my son was two and a half and we got a brand new tent. And I said, hey, I'm gonna set this tent up in the backyard, get him used to like camping in a tent, um, and, and then we'll, we'll be able to go camping. Start him while he's young. And so he's two and a half, and, and we set this tent up, and we go, and I get his little blankie and all this stuff, and, and we get set up in the backyard, and, and we're, it's awesome, and it's so fun, and we go to sleep. <clears throat> we're in the middle of the night, I, the wind starts whipping like real hard through my backyard, and kind of blowing that tent around, and I'm like, oh shoot, this new tent's about to get destroyed. So I get out of the tent, and I go around the back side of the tent, like literally right on the other side of the tent from Levi, my son's head, and I'm, I'm sitting there trying to like secure it and strap it down. And, and, and in the, the middle of the night, in the chaos, I hear this very terrified voice that says, Daddy! He had woken up and he realized that I wasn't in the tent. And so he says, Daddy! Daddy! And I'm, I'm literally like inches from him, but just on the other side of the tent. 
And what was amazing was I said, Levi, I'm, I'm right here. I'm right here. And, and he says, uh, oh, okay. What? Like, okay, cool. <laughs> and I secure the tent. I go back inside. He's dead asleep. One hundred, like, I have to check to make sure he's alive. Right? I'm like, did you, what happened to you just now? Dude, he was just so secure. He realized, oh, he's, you're right here. You're not far from me. You're not away from me. You're right here. And that gave him enough peace to just go right back to sleep. And if you look at the story, it says that they thought it was a ghost, but verse 20, he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. And it says that they were willing to take him on board. See, though they didn't see him, though they weren't looking for him, what was really unique about this is they recognized his voice, that they knew the voice of Jesus. And they knew the voice of Jesus for the same reason that Levi knew my voice when I was right on the other side of the tent. It's because they spent time with Jesus. See, the more we spend time with Jesus, the more we understand and we recognize his voice, the more we understand and recognize his leading, the Holy Spirit's leading and the direction in our life, the more we are familiar with the character of God in the tough situations when we spend more time with him. See, these men had spent a lot of time with him. So, so though their fear blinded them for a minute, they heard the voice of the Lord and immediately they were at peace. Immediately, there, there, there was a, a peace that came over them. They invited them into the boat. They invited them into their situation. And here's what happened. Matthew records, it says, then the sea stopped. And it just went peaceful. That there was no more storm. And then what's miraculous, even here, it says that at once, the boat was at the shore where they were heading. What's crazy about God is he goes beyond our physics. He goes beyond uh, um, Newton's law. He, he goes beyond what gravity says is possible for us. He goes beyond what buoyancy says is possible for us. He goes beyond what our situations say is possible for us. He goes beyond how big the brokenness seems to be in our life. He goes beyond what we think is possible when we evaluate the situation and the hurdles in front of us. He says, man, that hurdle is too big for you, but it's not too big for me that he continues to remind the disciples and it's recorded that we would continue to remember that God is much bigger than the situation in front of us and he's much bigger than the situation um, that we're dealing with in the moment. He's much bigger than the past mistakes and the past regrets, the things that we think are holding us back from the future. He's much bigger than these things. And he says, man, would you invite me into the boat? When you invite me into the boat, let me do what I do, which is, is I take care of the things you can't take care of, but you've got to trust me. You've got to trust that, that I'm the one that does that. You've got to listen to my direction. You've got to follow me in that. And so we're going to head to community groups in a minute, but, but I just want to leave you with three things. I want to leave you with three things, and, and this is it. The first is this, is that he's able to accomplish the impossible. He's able to accomplish the impossible. Like, I don't, I don't know if he always will. I don't know if it's always his plan to accomplish the impossible. I, I think about like, man, your parents are split up and you're just praying that God would bring them back together. Like, I, I, I know he can. I hear testimony after testimony about how, how Jesus has restored broken marriages. And I, and I really think that, that is God's desire is to restore broken marriages. But it doesn't mean that that's always what's gonna happen. But the brokenness you feel in that, the thing you think you're never gonna get over, the anger that you are harboring in you because of that, and I'm never gonna be able to deal with this. I was right here. Jesus says, man, I'm, I'm, I'm bigger than that. I accomplish the impossible. That I go beyond what you think is possible. There's nothing impossible with me. The second thing is this that you need to know. That he's often closer than we think. See, I think Satan's goal for you, Satan who, who is totally rebelled against God and who wants nothing to do with God and who wants no one to have anything to do with God, who has a spiritual war um, going on for your soul, what Satan wants you to believe and wants you to, to live with is that you're completely alone. 
eyes right here. That the problems you deal with, that the things you're struggling with, that the, the, the issues you have in your life, that he wants you to believe that you're the only one who's ever dealt with that. And you're the only one who will ever deal with that. And there's so much shame in that. And there's so much embarrassment in that, that you could never tell anyone about that. That God would be even ashamed of you for that. That you can't go anywhere with it. You've just got to hold it and you've got to deal with it. He says, no, 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 I'm closer than you think. I know what you're going through. And I, I'm... That he's never far from you. But that he is near. And if you are a believer and you know Jesus, he says, man, my spirit lives in you. Don't you believe that lie that you're alone? Don't you believe that lie that you're the only one that struggles or the only one that has it, that you can't go anywhere for help? That's not true. I'm closer than you think. And the third thing is this, is that he calms the storm. He calms the storm. I mean, it, it takes a, an act it takes a, a movement within your heart and in your mind that like God really kind of has to also start, but it takes an act of like inviting him into the boat, of recognizing his voice and saying, Jesus, would you, would you come into the storm? Would you, would you come into this boat? Now, my French stuff is a mess. School is a mess. Home life is a mess. Jesus, I need you to calm the storm. I can't calm it myself. And Jesus does. That he calms the storm. He calms the storm. But you know what's also interesting? Is it says that instantly they were where they needed to be. It wasn't where they, they decided they wanted to be. It wasn't where they rode themselves to be. But it's where Jesus wanted them to be. Jesus directed the boat, the boat they were in that was currently in a storm. He directed it exactly where it needed to be. What that means when you invite Jesus into your boat is you say, Jesus, I'm willing to go wherever you want me to go, whatever you want this to be, however you want to do this. And as you spend time in God's word and recognize God's character, you understand God's will for your life. You understand what he, he's calling from you, who he's calling you to be in the situations you're in right now. So as we close, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna invite you um, to close your eyes and to bow your heads and not for anything special, not for anything like, oh, wild, but just simply because I just want you to hear. Like, I wanna limit all other distractions. I just want you to hear for a minute. And I, would, I would challenge you to consider what the boat you're in look like. Like, like, who have you invited into the boat that you believe is going to lead you in the right direction and in a good direction? Maybe that's a relationship. Maybe that's a sport. Maybe that's a substance. Maybe that's your grades. You're just married to those. This is, the, this is what's in my boat. This is gonna lead me in the right direction. And, and here's just what's gonna happen. I'll just give you a spoiler alert. You're gonna hit a storm and they're not gonna prevail. Your girlfriend will leave you. Football will fail you. Grades won't, work, won't, won't, won't really be a big deal in three years, four years, five years, eight years. They're, they're not gonna be a big deal anymore. They just don't last. But Jesus says, man, would you, would you invite me into the boat? I'm the one who walks on water. I'm the one who overcomes all. Either way, here's what you need to know. And this is, this is really, I just want you to hear this. No other distractions, nothing else. Is that he sees your need. He sees your need. Not like, oh, he sees like you need more Instagram likes or he sees that like you really need to get an A on your algebra test. No, no, like he sees your, really, your, your real need of like that you really need to know you're loved. That you really need to understand your value. 
that you really need a good father. And he sees your need. And he knows your fears. He knows what you're scared of. He knows what's worrying you. He knows the anxiety that comes. But he is bigger than the situation you are in. And he's bigger than any situation you will ever be in. And he's bigger. And would you just let that rest on your heart and on your mind? He sees your need. He knows what you're afraid of. And he's bigger than the situation. That you can trust him. He does not run away when things get scary and things get hard. He says, would you continue to run to me and let me be the good father who protects you and who guides you and who leads you. God, we love you. We thank you for that promise. Would you be with us for the next 15 minutes as we spend time in our community groups just kind of digesting this? Or would you give us transparency about what this means for us? How we handle that. God, would you bless these next few minutes in Jesus' name? Amen.